Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Of course, BS stands for Building Science. Tonight's topic is high-performance hydronics and specifically air-to-water heat pumps. Of course, you all know me. I'm Travis Brungard. I'm here in Prairie Village, Kansas, where I build what I like to think are high-performance new homes with uh, my partner, Joe Cook, at Catalyst Construction. And tonight, I am drinking a lemon. Hello. Uh, it's a Berliner Weiss-style <laughs> beer from uh, Fields and Ivy in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, and I know you'd love it, then. So I've saved you some. Next time you're in Casey, I got you, bro. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Uh, as you all know, BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our Zoom show. The Brew Crew and our guests volunteer our time each month to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. Now, if you're interested in starting your own group, we would, of course, encourage that. And you can find advice on how to do that at thebsandbeershow.com. Or you can always ask one of us. Uh, although the first thing I do with people ask is direct them to that website because the resources are already uh, accumulated. And you probably have noticed that there have been a lot of new groups popping up. So there may be one in your area already. A lot of that's easily found on Instagram uh, by just typing in BS and beer, and then you'll see a whole long list of them. Uh, before I pass it off to Ben, I want to quickly thank our media partners. Of course, that's Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine. With that, my good friend, Ben Bogey. Thanks, Travis. Uh, this, this evening, I'm drinking a lovely old-fashioned poured with some bourbon that my friend Brad Morrison, friend of the show, sent me recently. And much, much appreciated and much needed this evening. <laughs> so first off, find the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen. Post questions and comments there. Be sure you click on all panelists and attendees or everyone, whichever one shows up. Otherwise, Zoom tends to revert to panelists only, and sometimes <laughs> it's hard for us to keep track of what you're asking or saying. So Fine Home Building sends out Zoom reminders each month. If you want to receive those as well as other information, join our mailing list at thebsandbeershow.com or check out the monthly BS and Beer post on Green Building Advisor. The video recording of tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor and all past shows can be found on YouTube and through a link at thebsandbeershow.com. Uh, additionally, if anybody would like copies of the chat, uh, I'll post my email in the chat towards the end of the show. Shoot me an email and I'll send you a copy of the chat log. So special announcement, registration is open for the Texas Building Science Symposium, which is coming next week, November 9th and 10th in Austin, Texas. Uh, you can catch me, Steve Basic there, Jake Bruton, Glenn Matthewson, Enrico Bonolari, uh, Allison Bales, and a host of others talking about trying to build better buildings. Uh, so if you're not registered and you can make it to the area, I encourage you to do so because it's a bargain for what you get. Uh, thanks to sponsors, the registration fee is only $100, so sign up and get there. Uh, Emily is doing a pretty good house training series through Fine Home Building called the Sustainable Building Accelerator. Uh, the remaining uh, book authors and others will have guest appearances, and you can find out more about that on Fine Home Building's website or Green Building Advisor. And Travis, back over to you for some introductions. Yeah, let's let's talk about our guests. Uh, I'm going to start with our good friend Kyle Mock. Kyle is... Uh, an architect, uh, a leader in our industry, and someone that we've had on the show in the past. So I won't, I won't give you the long paragraph of all of his qualifications. I'll skip straight to saying thank you, Kyle, for joining us, especially on a little bit shorter notice. We always enjoy having you on. And of course, uh, I would like you to tell people more about yourself. And uh, always, what are you drinking? I'm drinking my standard, and that's good old H2O. So just Classic. water once again. I don't know. I've been really thirsty lately. So keep, keep down in the water. Um, but I guess uh, no qualifications, but I am technically not an architect. Uh, my background is architectural engineering. And so I am working as an architect and I own an architecture firm. So, uh, but I cannot give myself that label. <laughs> not yet. Anyway. Mike Maines, you're so modest. You guys yeah, that are yeah, designing yeah. And, and doing these amazing things. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say that while you may not have that, uh, that architecture degree, your services to the design community are much appreciated and apparent throughout all the work that we've seen uh, from you. And so uh, while you don't have that one designation, you are doing a bang up job at that job. Uh, and if you want, you can just rest on your laurels as a, a solar decathlete. How about that? That's true. Twice over. And a rules inspector and multiple other times I've participated in different ways, but um, I might be helping teach with them actually this year. So That's we'll awesome. see how that goes. Um, but yeah. <laughs> 
Well, good on you, Kyle. I think of you as a gentleman and a scholar, and I'm pleased that you're back to join us again. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have John Sigenthaler, who is a licensed mechanical engineer and principal at Appropriate Designs, formed in 1983 to provide engineering design services specifically focused on low energy use buildings. Uh, a graduate of, I'm going to miss say this, so you can correct me as soon as we're done here. It's Rensselaer Polytechnic, Polytechnic Institute. Thank you, John. Uh, and of course, John has over 36 years of experience in designing modern hydronic heating systems. He's sort of the foremost expert on it. He's also an associate professor emeritus at uh, emeritus, excuse me, at Mohawk Valley Community College in Utica, New York. He's the author of textbooks, Modern Hydronic Heating and Heating with Renewable Energy, and of course has written numerous other publications dealing with hydronic heating. John's joined us before. We're thrilled to have you back. John, what did we miss in that introduction? And of course, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm with Kyle tonight. I've got the H2O. Uh, Teetotalers all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great to be here. Uh, I've got, you know, I've got a few slides. Uh, I just before I jump to those, though, uh, high performance hydronics, I know, was the title. And, you know, hydronic heating actually goes way back into the late 1800s. And many people today still think when you talk about hydronic heating, they think you're talk about, talking about hydroponic gardening. Uh, something like that. So it's not a well-known term. It's it's better known up in the Northeast uh, where, you know, heating dominates the HVAC loads. But um, it's water, it's any type of heating or cooling using water as the transport media. So whether it's a boiler, a solar collector, a heat pump, uh, a wood-fired boiler, uh, anything that produces warm water, heated water, uh, is potentially a source for a hydronic system. And we're, we're going to call that the heat source. And then the balance of the system, the distribution system, would move heated water through different heat emitters. And there's, again, there's a wide range of products from thin tube baseboard, cast iron radiators. Those are kind of the older, you'll find those in legacy systems. More modern systems will be uh, some type of radiant panel heating. It could be radiant floor heating, uh, as well as radiant walls, radiant ceilings. Uh, we've done all those in different projects over the years. Uh, panel radiators is another one. I'm gonna kind of focus on that a little bit more tonight because I think it's, uh, given the characteristics of panel rads, they, they're very well suited for low energy houses. And um, they actually install for less money and easier, faster than some radiant floor systems do. So, um, should I just jump to my slides and kind of run through those at this point? I think that's great. Let's let's kick it off. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me just get. It. Can everybody see that? Okay. Hasn't popped up yet. Hasn't popped up. But the screen uh, share. I have to go back and share screen again. Maybe let me just see if I can do that. Yep. I think that's it. Please bear with me one second here. Share. There you go. Seen it. Yeah, I'm going to jump. Okay, still good to go? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'll jump right through it. You know, many, uh, certainly many people that have worked with low energy buildings, as well as even like commercial buildings, uh, these things are quite prolific. The ductless uh, heat pumps, uh, sometimes referred to as mini splits, where you have an outdoor unit with anywhere from one to maybe four or five of these indoor consoles. Uh, that would be a char uh, characterized as an air-to-air -air heat pump um, because the source of the low-grade heat is the outside air and the delivery fluid, if you will, for heating and cooling within the building is also air. So air-to-air -air heat pump, very common. And of course, geothermal, I, I refer to geothermal heat pumps today as kind of the darling of the HVAC industry. Uh, many editors love the word geothermal, uh, consumers, utility people, state energy planners, they all kind of key in on geothermal. And of course, there are some pretty enticing incentives out there, both at different states, uh, utility programs, uh, federal level tax credits, and so forth. So geothermal heat pumps is a pretty well-known flavor, if you will, of heat pumps. But when it comes to air to water heat pumps, a lot of people, including professionals in the HVAC trade, just aren't familiar with an air to water heat pump. So what does it do? Well, again, I talk about flavors of heat pumps. So we talked about air to air, and we've talked about 
One form of geothermal would be water to water where we're using a geothermal earth loop, uh, typically piping buried in the ground to absorb low grade heat. And then we're delivering higher temperature heat using water uh, coming off the other side of that heat pump. So what we're doing with an air to water heat pump is if you will, we're borrowing the air side technology to absorb heat from outside air. And today that applies even to air at sub zero degree Fahrenheit temperature. Some of these machines can actually operate down to about minus 20. Now the performance is not very good at that point, but just the fact that the heat pump is still running at that extreme cold condition uh, is a result of uh, some major advances in, in refrigeration technology uh, that have uh, largely been developed through air to air heat pumps, but are now being integrated into the air side of an air to water heat pump. And then we're using the water side, the, the hydronic side to deliver both heating as well as cooling. And the way we use water to do cooling, uh, we have chilled water. Uh, we don't wanna just pump that through radiators or pump it through a radiant floor uh, because of condensation. So there are ways to do it. Uh, one of the methods I'll show you tonight is with an air handler, essentially a, a blower and a coil. Uh, we're gonna send the chilled water through the coil and then we're gonna blow air across that coil to dehumidify and, and cool that air and, and then deliver that air into the space. So what do they look like? Um, one configuration of air to water heat pumps that is common is called a monoblock heat pump. And that's actually a, a term that comes out of the European market. Um, I'll use the term self-contained. These units are factory charged with refrigerant. Um, when you buy this unit and install it, there is no need to put refrigerant gauges on it or you know, add refrigerant or do anything that normally would be associated with a split system, um, which is you know, more common with air conditioning. So what do you need to hook this up? You basically need a, two pipes, one to bring water out to it, the other to bring the conditioned water back into the building, and then an electrical harness. And you can see similarities in these products are basically a box uh, that sits outside. It's going to be on a stand in, in a cold climate to keep it above snow, keep it above the bugs, the leaves, the grass clippings. Uh, you'll see the fans on there. They are basically drawing outside air across the refrigerant coil. And uh, in the winter, when, when this is in a heating mode, uh, that refrigerant coil is called the evaporator. We're evaporating a refrigerant. And uh, also inside the unit would be a compressor, uh, what's called a reversing valve, uh, more or less standard components that would be in any type of a heat pump system. So again, monoblocks are self-contained, pre-charged at the factory, ready to, ready to go. So in the heating mode over here on the left, uh, I won't take a lot of time to go through the refrigerant cycle uh, other than saying it's a very standardized, very proven cycle. Um, the air handling section at the top of the heat pump is just blowing outside air across the coil. Uh, we're evaporating a refrigerant. That refrigerant is going down through a compressor. Compressor is bringing the temperature and the pressure up substantially. And then the hot refrigerant gas is going into another heat exchanger, which in refrigeration terms is called a condenser. And essentially hot refrigerant is transferring heat to a fluid. And typically today that fluid, uh, it could be water, but in most cases, it's going to be a mixture of water and antifreeze, uh, especially in a cold climate. And the reason for the antifreeze is a prolonged power outage uh, with just water in an outside unit. Obviously, you're, you're setting it up for a potential freeze. So um, in the cooling mode, the reversing valve just reverses the function of the air handling section and the um, refrigerant to water heat exchanger. So we're producing a stream of chilled fluid going into the building. And typically that fluid leaving the heat pump is in the range of about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is cool enough that when it goes through the air handler, it can uh, cool the air as well as wring some of the moisture out of the air. And it can actually produce excellent comfort. Uh, chill water cooling has been used in larger buildings for decades. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, I mentioned the use of antifreeze. Um, 
in most climates within the U.S. and in basically all climates in Canada, the manufacturers are requiring the use of antifreeze and they're doing it to be safe. They don't want the unit to freeze up outside. So one way to do it, if you see in the top here, is to use the uh, antifreeze solution, which is typically about a 25 to 40 percent solution of non-toxic uh, propylene glycol antifreeze, a common antifreeze used in a lot of hydronic systems, and water. And that fluid would go through the entire system. So the same fluid that goes through the heat pump would also be going through, let's say, the panel radiators or any other piping in the system. The other way to do it down at the bottom is to install a heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger would have the antifreeze solution between the heat exchanger and the outdoor unit. So that circuit is much smaller. So obviously you'd be using less antifreeze, but the downside of using a heat exchanger is it imposes a performance penalty on the heat pump. It forces the heat pump to operate at conditions, higher temperature conditions that bring down both the heating capacity and, and also the efficiency. And uh, with a heat pump, the efficiency is expressed in, in what's called a coefficient of performance. So the higher the coefficient of performance or the higher the CLP, the better. Uh, and also a heat exchanger requires more hardware, two circulators and other hydronic trim because now you're creating two separate isolated closed loops, both of which need things like air separation and pressure protection and circulation. So of these two, I'll be very honest, I, I used to feel that the heat exchanger was justified. I actually have that system in my office with a heat exchanger. It does work, it, it, it works well, but the performance penalty is such that I, I prefer to go with antifreeze in the entire system. Um, and you simply eliminate the heat exchanger, you eliminate one of the circulators and you do bring up the annual performance of the heat pump, which you know, if you're striving for the minimal energy use, uh, you're going to do it better with uh, use without the heat exchanger. Now, another physical configuration for air to water heat pumps is, is called a split system. And this is more aligned with, uh, for example, if you think about a carrier air conditioning system, you have an outdoor unit, you have an indoor air handling unit, and you have a refrigerant line set that connects those two units together. And in the case of an air to water, you, you have the outdoor unit. There is no water in the outdoor unit, which is a plus. Uh, it doesn't uh, require you to use antifreeze, but it does require some basic refrigeration tools and skills to install these because you are going to install that line set. You're gonna use a vacuum pump um, to um, basically evacuate that line set. Uh, you're gonna do a pressure test on that line set with nitrogen. These are all standard uh, procedures when you, whenever you're using a uh, split system uh, refrigeration system. So the, the plus is uh, no water outside, no need for antifreeze. The downside is these do require you to have some basic refrigeration skills and tooling. So if it is a plumber uh, that perhaps may not have those tools or those skills, uh, this, is, this is not the configuration to go with. Having said that, getting those skills is, is pretty straightforward. Um, getting licensed to buy refrigerant and so forth is not all that difficult. So both have their pluses both, you know, and minuses, but as this market starts to, to grow in North America, uh, you will see more of the monoblock, the self-contained systems, because they're simply easier to install, uh, not requiring the refrigerant skills or the tooling. Now, the critical thing to remember with any heat pump, and, it's, you know, and this applies with air to water, the colder it is outside, the lower the heating capacity of the unit. So when we talk about a heat pump that might have, let's say, 48,000 BTUs per hour of heat output, that's a nominal rating at some prescribed condition, some outdoor temperature and some uh, what we call leaving water temperature. That's the temperature of the the fluid leaving the heat pump. The colder it is, the lower the capacity, and also the higher the temperature, the water or the mixture of water and antifreeze is leaving the unit, the lower the capacity. So 
Uh, we can't control the outdoor temperature, but we can by design, design hydronic distribution systems for relatively low water temperatures. And one of the numbers I'll, I'll throw out just as a consideration, it's not a code or an ASHRAE standard, uh, design any hydronic system going forward so that on a design day, the coldest outdoor temperature, the maximum water temperature is 120 degrees. If you do that, you're building long-term value into that system. Uh, and keep in mind that hydronic systems, well-designed, well-installed, properly maintained, they can last for decades. So it's a, it's a long-term value proposition. The lower the water temperature, the higher that value ultimately will be over the life of that system. And it's the same story with coefficient of performance. Uh, the warmer it is outside, the higher the COP, and also the lower the leaving water temperature, the higher the COP. So the, the takeaway is we want to do everything possible to keep the fluid temperature that the heat pump operates at as low as practical uh, because it will improve seasonal performance and that will reduce the amount of electricity required. Now, we've talked about the heat pumps. Well, let's talk briefly on, you know, obviously there's a wide range of hydronic heat emitters, but I tend to like panel radiators when, we, when we're looking at a project that is a low energy building and we're going to bring hydronics as, as well as a heat pump into the picture. And these are just some photos of uh, some panel radiators. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you have seen these before. Uh, these are made out of steel. They have a, um, uh, it's, it's not a paint, uh, it's some type of an electroplated finish on there, a very durable finish. You see the two tubes coming up through the floor. Those are typically half inch PEX or half inch PEX aluminum PEX tubes. And in the upper right corner of uh, these radiators, uh, that one in the center at the top, you see there's a knob in that upper right corner. That's a thermostatic radiator valve. That is what is controlling the heat output of that radiator. And it's doing it by sensing air temperature and regulating the flow rate through the panel. As the air temperature rises, that device will automatically reduce the flow rate going through the panel and hence reduce its heat output. And quite accurately, they can maintain room temperatures within about plus or minus one degree. Uh, and you can adjust it. If you want the room at you know, lower temperatures at night, for example, or just lower temperatures in general, you simply turn the valve to a, a lower setting. Um, over on the far right is another form of radiator. Uh, it's a towel warmer. Uh, these are used in bathrooms. Um, it serves as a rack to put a towel on and a, a warm dry towel is, is pretty nice on a, a cold, wet day, especially if you've spent the day outside. And it is certainly possible to combine panel radiators, towel warmers, and uh, you know different shapes and sizes together into a system. Um, generally, the panel rads that would be appropriate for these applications, they come in different thicknesses as well. And you can see in the top there, basically as you build up the thickness of the panel, you're adding more what are called water plates. That's, that's the portion of the radiator. Um, it's basically two formed steel plates that are welded together at the perimeter. You're, you're increasing the amount of water in the panel and you're also increasing those fins that core, what looks like corrugated roofing. Those are steel fins that are welded to the water plates and those are there to enhance convection. So how thick the panel is will be determined by, first of all, how big is the space where we're gonna put the panel? Uh, for example, if we had a window threshold 18 inches off the floor, we, we really can't use a 24 inch high panel. We, we have a height restriction. We may have a length restriction. Uh, and the way you can compensate for these restrictions is by increasing the thickness of the panel. So ultimately it comes down to how much surface area the, uh, the panel radiator has. The more the surface area or the higher the surface area, the lower the water temperature can be. And we've designed a project a couple of years ago where the highest water temperature any of these panels sees is 110 degree Fahrenheit. And that's in what I would call a pretty good house to use one of the terms that, that you folks like. Uh, it's a well-insulated house. It's not a passive house, but 
it has a load in the range of about 13 BTUs per hour per square foot at design. So uh, to work with these lower water temperatures and keep the performance of the heat pump high, basically you're going with higher, uh, larger panels, either taller, wider, or thicker. And most of the manufacturers, uh, they have a whole range of dimensions as well as associated heat outputs versus water temperature. So it allows you to size these panels up for these relatively low water temperatures. Uh, the panels themselves are very simple. You, you basically put a couple brackets on the wall. They would be lagged into studs or you know, masonry fasteners if it's a, if a masonry wall. And these are spring-loaded brackets and you see the basic idea there. You basically put the brackets on the wall, take the panel, hang it on the bottom of the bracket and just rotate it towards the wall. And the little C-shaped portion of that bracket up at the top, it just lifts up and then it snaps back down into the grill on the top of the panel. And that's it, that, that holds the panel. Uh, these panels are not very heavy. Um, a two foot by four foot, two foot high, four foot wide panel weighs about 89 pounds. And it only holds a little over two gallons of water. So it is much, much lighter than what a cast iron radiator of equivalent output would be. So again, structurally, they don't really present many problems. Um, and you'll see at the, uh, some of the photos I've shown you, uh, the piping connections are typically two inches on center. Some panels, the piping connections are right up the center of the panel. In others, they tend to be over towards the right side of the panel, but typically two inches on center is common. And uh, I say the, the most common piping material would be PEX or PEX aluminum PEX. And again, here's a close up of a panel. Um, you'll see over here, uh, the thermostatic valve uh, on the top right corner. Uh, here's a close-up of that spring-loaded bracket. Again, the top just snaps uh, into the top of the radiator. And then down at the bottom, this is what's called a dual isolation valve. It's essentially just two ball valves in one fixture. And the two uh, white tubes coming up through the floor there are half-inch PEX aluminum PEX. There's a little discussion plate that uh, trims it up down at the bottom. So in a new construction situation, they're easy to install, uh, but they're especially nice in retrofitting because essentially if you can bring a couple pieces of half inch PEX tubing from wherever the source of the warm water is to where the panel is, and it, I liken that to running electrical cable, you can pull it through frame and cavities and so forth, uh, much easier than dealing with rigid pipe. Uh, if you can get that tubing pulled through there, it's, it's easy to mount one of these panels on the wall. Um, so it lends itself to expandability in the future. You may build a house and have a pick a number, six of these panels in the house. And five years later, maybe you want to put another panel in a recreation room in the basement, or maybe you put an addition on a house. Uh, it's quite easy to add another circuit to the system. And I'll, I'll show you what that distribution system looks like shortly here. So, Actually, we're right there. The distribution system I, I really like for these panel rads is called a home run distribution system. And it's a very simple idea. Uh, you have a manifold station, which is identical to what would be used with, let's say, floor heating. Uh, it could be a brass manifold. It could be stainless steel. It could be as simple as a copper manifold that just has stub outs on it. And from the manifold, it's half inch PEX or PEX aluminum PEX tubing, uh, just going out to each radiator. So each radiator has its own supply and return. And what that does, is allows each radiator to independently regulate. Um, we're combining that with a variable speed circulator that will automatically change speed as those valves on the panel rads open and close. Uh, this is, relatively new technology. I would call it state-of-the-art technology. And some of these circulators, uh, especially in a low load home, even on a design day, you're looking at 30 watts or less of power input to operate the system. So the amount of electrical energy that goes into moving water through a system like this is, is very, very small in comparison to the electricity required to distribute forced air. 
And the rest of it is I'm, I'm showing a buffer tank here. Um, the buffer tank is there, especially if the heat pump is just a single speed device, if it just turns on and off, its capacity when it's on far exceeds what, for example, one panel radiator would be able to dissipate. So to avoid, avoid short cycling the heat source, uh, we use a buffer tank. And essentially the, it's as simple as let the heat pump maintain a certain temperature range in the buffer tank. And then the circulator runs 24 seven during the heating season, which probably sounds like it's energy wasteful, but literally we're talking about between 10 and 15 cents per day in a typical Northeastern location to keep that circulator running. It's, it's very, very small. And uh, each of the uh, thermostatic valves on each panel simply adjust the flow rate through their associated panel based on what temperature that room is supposed to be maintaining. So when you have solar gains or other internal gains coming in, uh, this is a really elegant system in a sense that it automatically senses and adjusts for those internal gains in different areas of the building at different times of the day. And uh, yeah, I won't go through all these. Uh, I'm sure we can get a PDF file out if, if anybody's interested in it. But of all the different hydronic piping arrangements, um, especially going back into legacy designs, most of, many of those hydronic distribution designs were based on rigid pipe. And with the availability of PEX, uh, we can do things quite a bit differently. And as I mentioned, this is one of the simplest and it's a very repeatable design. I'm, I'm showing five panel rads here. And if you look at the manifold, you see I've left a couple spare connections on a manifold and that's, that's for future expandability. So again, five years from now, somebody wants to add another panel or perhaps add a towel warmer. It's as simple as run the pecs from the manifold up to that location and, and uh, put it in play. So it's a nice system. Um, you know, oftentimes people want to know what, you know, why should we use water when, you know, air is obviously available? Um, well, one of the big differences is the size of the conduit, if you will, that's necessary to move heat with water versus air. And this is nothing we can change. It's based on the physical properties of water and air, uh, specifically density and specific heat. So as a quick comparison, I, I just took 12,000 BTUs per hour, which corresponds to what in the heat pump world is called a ton of capacity. Uh, so 12,000 BTUs per hour is one ton. I can move one ton of heat transfer using a half inch PEX tube with a 20 degree temperature drop through a half, you know, half inch tube. And you can, I've drawn that in on a uh, two by 12 floor joist. So it's minimally invasive to the structure, a hole big enough for that tube. Uh, for a half inch tube, you'd probably drill about a three quarter inch or maybe a seven eighths inch hole so that the tube isn't scrubbing through the uh, hole in the joist. Um, but that has virtually no effect on that structure. Uh, if we were gonna do it with air, we've gotta have much larger cross sections. So a nine inch diameter round duct, or in this case, a seven by 10 rectangular duct. And again, that, that is simply due to the properties that we've been given to work with. Uh, the photos you see there in the lower left, those are half inch tube sets running along joists or running through holes in, in some of the eye joists. And then over on the right, just, you know, those are compromises in aesthetics that are necessary when you, uh, when you have to accommodate ducting uh, to do a, a proper supply and proper return air uh, forced air distribution system. So water is a big advantage in that respect. Um, real quickly, I, you know, I, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the differences between water and air. And just to give you a feel, we did some calculations on a, on a hypothetical home run system, uh, which is shown over on the right there. It's eight panel rads, uh, each of which has 120 feet of half inch PEX tubing. Uh, 60 feet on supply and 60 on return. Uh, I can run that system and deliver almost 31,000 BTUs per hour using less than 10 watts of electrical input to that circulator. 
And the circulator I'm showing is just an example of a state-of-the-art product. Uh, that circulator actually, not only is it variable speed, but it has Bluetooth connection in it. So you can put the app on your phone and you can actually see the wattage as well as the flow rate that that circulator is operating at. And we've used some of these circulators and systems and seen wattages anywhere from maybe 15 to maybe 30 watts, depending on how many radiator valves are open at a given time. So very, very small amounts of power. Uh, and we, we like to compare distribution systems both between different hydronic systems as well as with forced air. We use an index called distribution efficiency. And all that is, is the number of BTUs per hour that are being delivered, let's say at design load, divided by the electrical power required to make that delivery. And with a uh, system like this, <clears throat> we're delivering almost 3,600 BTUs per hour per watt of electrical input to that circulator. And I think I get a slide, yeah. Just to give you a quick comparison, if you took a standard furnace, and I realize more, most of the modern furnaces do have high efficiency motors, <clears throat> but a standard furnace with a shaded pole or permanent split capacitor motor, uh, delivering 80,000 BTUs per hour will require about 850 watts. So you have to move a lot more air than water because air is much less dense and, and lower specific heat material. Anyway, its distribution efficiency is 94 BTUs per hour per watt. We just looked at a system that was almost 3,600 BTUs per hour per watt. And if you, you put those two together in a ratio, uh, what the, the implication is the, that particular hydronic system compared to that particular furnace is delivering heat using less than 3% of the electrical input energy to operate the distribution system. And again, I wanna stress, this has nothing to do with what is creating the heat, whether it's oil, gas, heat pump, whatever. This is a rating strictly that applies to the distribution system. And uh, hydronics is, is really unbeatable. Uh, it's very easy to get a 10 to one ratio between the power input of a hydronic system and a forced air system. Um, and with good design, uh, even better. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of quick examples, system layouts. Uh, you know, again, here is a mono black heat pump outside. We've got tubing coming in. Uh, so essentially what that heat pump is doing is monitoring the temperature in the buffer tank. And it's simply turning on and off to maintain some range of temperature. It could be a fixed temperature range, like turn on at 100, turn off at 110, as an example, or it could be based on what's called outdoor reset. And outdoor reset is where the water temperature in the buffer tank will decrease as it gets warmer outside. And the, the goal is to have the water just warm enough to heat the building. And the underlying reason for doing that is to keep the COP and the capacity of the heat pump as high as possible. Uh, the distribution system to the right side of the buffer tank is just, again, I'm just drawing a representation of a home run system with some panel radiators. Again, we could mix in towel warmers. We, we could even mix in some radiant panel circuits. For example, we could do floor heating under a kitchen or under a bathroom and mix that in along with maybe a towel warmer and maybe three or four panel rats. So we have a lot of flexibility when it comes to laying out these systems. Now, this is a heating only system. Uh, there is no, I'm not showing any backup heat and I'm not showing any type of cooling detail. Uh, those are potential liabilities. Uh, obviously, if the heat pump is down for service, um, you aren't getting heat here. Um, and I want to stress again, because we have a lot of zoning going on, uh, we, have, we have circumstances where we can have a very small heating requirement within the building and we don't want to short cycle the heat pump. So the buffer tank is basically the shock absorber, if you will, for BTUs that it allows the heat pump to have reasonable on off times uh, and still allows you to, if you will, trickle heat out where it's necessary in the building. Now here's where we've incorporated either a new boiler or an existing boiler. And, and I would stress to you, 
when you have retrofits that do have existing boilers in them, when that boiler has service life left, it can be incorporated along with the heat pump into the system. And the beauty of that is we can operate even an oil fired boiler, a residential scale oil fired boiler, we can operate that on about 400 watts. So in a power outage, a very small generator could keep that entire system operating. Whereas if it's an all electric system, especially if it has an electric resistance backup device, like an electric boiler or elements in the tank, that's going to require a, a substantially larger boiler, I think 15 or 20 kW in some cases. So uh, there is a degree of resiliency, I, I feel, by incorporating that. And keep in mind that we can displace, and we've done a lot of modeling on, on these we can displace on the order of 85 to 95% of the total seasonal energy away from fossil fuel and to electricity uh, through the heat pump. So the vast majority of the energy is coming from the heat pump and the boiler is acting as our backup, as our supplemental heater. If, it's, uh, if it is 20 below zero and uh, you know, a four ton heat pump is operating more like one and a half tons, the balance of that energy can come from the uh, existing boiler. And it's possible to even incorporate that in new construction. But we're running into a lot of circumstances now where there is an existing fossil fuel boiler. The clients are interested in adding a heat pump. Uh, and the question comes up, should we scrap that boiler? And, you know, if it's, if it's uh, 40 years old and it's requiring constant service and there's puddles of water around it, it's probably at the end of its service life. But if it has five to 10 years of service life left in it, uh, it's not a bad idea to build a system around it. So really all, all we're doing is putting the existing boiler in parallel with the heat pump. Both of them can now dump heat into that buffer tank. And there are a number of controls that are available to manage you know, operating the heat pump as the priority heat source and then bringing the boiler on as necessary. So, uh, here's a system, now we're building some cooling in. And down at the bottom of the schematic, you'll see there's an air handler with a chill water coil. And those blue lines represent piping that would be carrying chilled, uh, well, it'd be chilled antifreeze fluid. And right here to the right of the heat pump, you see what's called a diverter valve. And that's just a fork in a row. Um, in the heating mode, it sends the heated antifreeze into the buffer tank. And in the cooling mode, it sends it down into the coil of the air handler. Uh, and then within the buffer tank, you'll see I've drawn some coils. Those coils are internal coils made of copper or stainless steel. And potable water can flow through those coils and absorb heat from that buffer tank uh, to at least preheat your domestic hot water. And then some other booster can be used to bring it up to a final temperature. For example, if the buffer tank was at 95 degrees, we might have water leaving those coils at around 90 degrees, which is cool. It's too cool for uh, most people on domestic hot water. So the 90 degree water goes into, I'm, I'm just showing a tank type water heater. Uh, it could be a, a tankless electric water heater as well. Uh, and you know, you're displacing again a major portion of the temperature lift in the water. So you're you are you are saving um, electricity in the sense that the heat pump is doing the majority of the energy input for domestic hot water. And then the auxiliary heating device is, is boosting it to the necessary temperature. Um, I've also shown a small electric boiler. Uh, again, there are literally hundreds of con possible configurations, mixing different types of auxiliary devices, different loads and so forth. I'm just trying to show some that are practical, repeatable, and, and especially suitable for uh, low energy houses. Okay, now I put this slide in as a, a caution. If you are dealing with chilled water from a heat pump for, for, from anything, it is imperative that you insulate and vapor seal the piping. Uh, and I, I stress that because many hydronic heating systems in North America do not have piping insulation on them uh, because they're operating as heating systems. They're, they're not subject to surface condensation, but passing 45 or 50 degree fluid through those pipes, you'll have condensation form uh, literally within seconds. 
And within a few minutes, you'll have condensation dripping from these pipes and you can make a mess in a hurry, especially if those pipes are installed above a drywall ceiling. So there are plenty of products out on the market. The, the most common one in small systems is generically an elastomeric foam. Uh, some of you might know it as K-Flex or Armaflex or a couple brands that are out there. Uh, not only do you wanna put the insulation on the pipe, you wanna make sure the joints are glued together. The, the key concept, don't let surrounding air come in contact with any piping or piping component that's conveying chilled water. Uh, it's very simple physics. If that piping surface is below the dew point, uh, you're going to get condensation. And in some cases, in a humid day in the summer, dew points can easily get up into the 60s, sometimes even into the 70s. And uh, that is well, you know, well above what the chill water temperature in these pipes is. Okay, uh, let's see, this one, uh, it's just another configuration. It's got the uh, fossil fuel boiler. It has cooling, it has the coils in the buffer tank. So we're getting space heating, domestic water heating, as well as cooling from this. And I should mention the air handler down at the bottom, that, that can go to a standard ducted delivery system. And you can tie an ERV or an HRV into the return side of that air handler and set up the controls in that air handler so it is operating at an airflow rate, approximately the same, maybe a little bit higher, than what the ERV or the HRV is. So that ducting system that is designed around delivering cooling can also be the distribution system for fresh air uh, coming through an HRV. So now, you know, we, we could say we're, we're, it's a total solution. We have space heating, cooling, domestic water, as well as ventilation and, and beyond just basic ventilation, heat recovery ventilation. Okay. Here's a, a system. This was actually installed uh, last year down near Albany, New York. Uh, you'll see the outside unit there on the left and then the indoor. This was actually a conversion for, for a house that had forced air uh, ducting in it. You'll see the, the older ducts up here at the top. Uh, it had a propane uh, furnace that was old and uh, the client actually went up to, they were paying over $4 per gallon for propane. It was just uh, a very, uh, very high price situation. So um, the new ducting here just ties into the old ducting. The old ducting had a size that was uh, large enough for the airflow rates required. And uh, in this particular system, the outdoor unit, it's a monoblock, so it supplies heated antifreeze. It comes into this box on the wall and inside that box are the controls, the valves, the circulators, that direct that heated fluid to either the air handler down here or over to this indirect water heater. So um, think of that indoor box there as kind of the hub of the system. It's, it's where the energy comes in and then based on how that system is supposed to be operating at any given time, it directs that, that heated fluid or chilled fluid to the appropriate uh, subsystem. And then over here on the wall, you'll see there's a manifold station. That's future expandability. That would allow you to add some panel rads or a towel warmer. Uh, right now, there's nothing connected to it, but it's ready to go. So uh, again, it, it's a nice upsell in terms of what you can do with an air-to-water heat pump, which would be, you know, really you can't do that with an air-to-air -air type of system. So that's one of the... Uh, one of the reasons that instead of going with an air to air heat pump in this particular project, we went with air to water, as well as providing uh, basically 100% of their domestic hot water. And that system was actually on this old house. If you, uh, you go to YouTube or Roku and you look up uh, season 20, episode 13, uh, Ross Trithui did a nice uh, uh, interview on the project and uh, it kind of describes and shows the system uh, right on the, the time when the system was being commissioned. And I think uh, I'm almost there. Um, again, I, I won't read those to you, but those are the um, key design concepts. Um, you know, we've talked about low water temperature, the flow rate, uh, whoever's designing the system, you need proper flow rate through the heat pump, uh, antifreeze when it's a monoblock to prevent freezing, 
um, vapor sealing the piping if it's chill water. Uh, here's a common sense one. Don't put the outdoor unit where rain or snow is going to fall off the roof directly on the unit. Uh, we've seen these things installed or similar equipment installed under metal roofs and an avalanche will come off that metal roof and it, it'll literally destroy anything below it. So you have to think about things like that. Uh, mounted above the snow, uh, typically minimum 12 inches above grade. And then you try to minimize the distance of piping between the outdoor and indoor unit. And with that, that's all the slides I've got. Um, I'll go back to uh, uh, questions or other inputs. Sure. Uh, John, first off, thank you for that, sir. That was incredibly <laughs> informative. Uh, I have to say, generally, I can keep up with the technical banter in the chat box, but tonight, uh, much of it was over my head. So we have many questions and comments. Um, I think okay. most importantly, we have a question from Miguel. He's wondering, when are we going to see the slide that shows us how to incorporate a, incorporate a sous vide loop from the manifold? A what loop? I believe that's a, a cooking <laughs> joke. Okay. Okay. Um, I, it's question that I'll throw out to you, sir, because I've been uh, looking into this a little bit recently. What's the difference between a two pipe and a four pipe system? Well, uh, they may be referring to the buffer tank, uh, two pipe and a four pipe. It's just two different piping configurations for a buffer tank. Um, I, I would have to show them to you, but both of them could work with an air to water heat pump. And uh, I'll, I'll throw another wrench in the gears here. You mentioned two pipe and four pipe. There's actually a three pipe buffer tank configuration. And that to me is the ideal one for a heat pump. Um, so, uh, again, I, the PDF, if we can get a PDF file of the slides, which I'm happy to share, I, I think most of the uh, schematics that I showed you tonight were using that three pipe buffer tank configuration. And for those that don't know what we're talking about, two pipe is you do heating or cooling, three pipe you could do a little bit of both, four pipe you can do a lot of different things. So it's about what <laughs> you're trying to accomplish. So large commercial buildings where you might get cooling on the outside, heating on the inside, or vice versa. Um, four pipe is how you can share heat between the building and the spaces. Right. More expensive. Though. Yeah, it came up in a question for us when we were looking at uh, doing radiant heating and cooling in a project. Uh, and the question was, is uh, how is your client going to tolerate those days where it's 40 degrees at night and then it's 70 during the day? Yeah. And yeah. they're going to have to switch the buffer tank temperature. If well, they're going to yeah. be tolerant of that, then it's a two pipe system intolerant of that. It's a four pipe system. Right. I'll go back. You know, there's actually two contexts where we could talk about two pipe or four pipe. I, I thought we were talking about buffer tanks, but on distribution, as, as Kyle was saying, a two pipe system, you can do every, all the units in the building would be on heating or they're all on cooling. A four pipe configuration, any given terminal unit, any given emitter or room could be on heating or cooling. So you're simultaneously running heated fluid and chilled fluid through the building and simply opening and closing zone valves to determine which, uh, which fluid goes through that particular space. I guess another configuration of that that I've seen in larger buildings is where you're running a medium temperature fluid throughout the building and then connecting that to individual heat pumps per Correct. unit. Yep, so that's then they're exchanging. Yep, that, that's a, a water loop heat pump system. Uh, it's common in, in commercial buildings. Uh, schools is a good example. I think you mentioned you know, where you have potential for perimeter areas to be in heating and core areas where there's no exposed surfaces to be in cooling. It's really good for that. Um, they've been around quite a while. Those actually use, <clears throat> instead of air to water heat pumps, they're using water to air. So they tie into the piping system. And uh, that piping system will usually run between about 70 and maybe 100 degrees at the most. Um, so the medium temperature distribution water and then the heat pumps are either extracting that heat and boosting the temperature or they're dumping heat back into that loop. I guess another question that keeps coming up, speaking of temperatures of fluid that you're running through the pipes, all of your photos are mostly showing copper. There's been a lot of questions about when and how could you use PEX in these systems? Yeah, anywhere. Um, copper is, is still pretty common in a mechanical room. Uh, it's just you know easier to, to get it to 
lay out in, in you know, vertical and horizontal orientations, uh, especially in short lengths. But from a temperature and pressure standpoint, PEX is, you know, it's not stressed at all in these systems. Uh, uh, PEX tubing is rated as, as high as 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and we aren't coming anywhere close to that. And the pressure in these systems typically 10 to 15 PSI, uh, again, well below what PEX is rated. So if it's a long run, uh, today, PEX is probably less expensive than copper, uh, but, you know, from a distribution standpoint, the home run system is a good example. It's a lot easier to run small diameter PEX than it would be to run small diameter copper. Just simply running it through framing cavities. Think of it as electrical cable as opposed to, you know, elbows and couplings and T's and, and soldering. Um, uh, it, it, it can be done, but rigid piping is, is a lot more expensive and uh, very labor intensive compared to small diameter pecs. So Another John, you mentioned, sorry. Yeah, sorry, you mentioned that, um, you know, these air to water heat pumps start losing efficiencies at, you know, cold temperatures mm -hmm. at negative 20. What is the, an average COP that you could expect from one of these units? Oh, maybe 1.2, something like that. But, you know, keep in mind, even in Northeast, uh, minus 20 is a very short duration. Infrequent. Of yeah. At all. So, you know, we look at when we model these systems, we look at bin temperature data for different locations. And uh, we just completed a project for NYSERDA where we've modeled uh, performance of air to water heat pumps, you know, in quite a range of climates within New York State from Plattsburgh to Brooklyn, all the way out to Buffalo. And we're seeing encouraging results. We're, we're seeing, even in Plattsburgh, uh, in, a, in a low temperature application, like with these lower temperature sized panel rats, we're, we're seeing seasonal COPs in a range of about 2.7 up to maybe 2.9. And in a warmer climate like Brooklyn, with the same distribution system, we're, we're seeing a little over three, uh, 3.03. So we're, we're actually seeing COPs that are pretty close to what a geothermal system can do. And this is one of the reasons I, I tend to get excited about air to water because we're approaching the performance of a geothermal system. I, I won't say we're always equaling it, but we're approaching the performance and we're doing it at far less in, installed cost. Uh, basically, we don't have any earth loop to deal with. And a residential earth loop with vertical boreholes, uh, $12,000, $15,000 easily. So that, that cost comes right out of it. And when we uh, look approaching. at uh, return on investment versus, you know, just seasonal COP, you know, I, I, I stress to people, you don't pay for COP, you pay for kilowatt hours. So when we look at return on investment as our metric, uh, we're seeing better results with the air to water than we are with some of the geothermal systems. Yeah, uh, approaching efficiency of uh, ground source heat pumps if they're installed properly. Correct. That should also be added in there. Correct. One other big thing that was sort of not totally mentioned is you, you talked a little bit about the refrigerant being mostly packaged in the unit or potentially a split system. But um, we, we had a project just recently that most of the chat box over here designed. Uh, but it, the whole goal of our project partly was to reduce carbon emissions. And so refrigerant carbon emissions can be exorbitant at times, especially if it's installed improperly or uh, not done correctly or it's leaking out. But with these systems, the refrigerant is mostly housed inside an outdoor unit and it's factory sealed. So the refrigerant potential leakage is, ex is so much lower. It's, it's way less significant. So that's a, another huge benefit um, that wasn't really mentioned, but I think yeah, it's worth um, noting. Most Absolutely. of the heat pumps today, uh, whether they're geothermal units or um, air to water, most of them are running an R410A refrigerant. And R410A is, is at the point where we're, we're going to start phasing it out next year. So the new refrigerants uh, that are coming in, and these are global trends, uh, there's a product called R32, which is a mixture of different refrigerants but it has a semi-flammable characteristic to it. So it's going to require different codes uh, as far as acceptance over here. A lot of heat pumps in Europe now, in Asia, 
are running on R32. And then, uh, believe it or not, another really good refrigerant is propane, uh, which is R207 or 270, something like that. Uh, propane actually has some really good refrigerant properties, but because it's flammable, uh, codes are going to have to adopt to it. Uh, but in watching some of the big players in the market, the, the companies like Mitsubishi, as an example, uh, they are looking down the road beyond our 410A uh, into lower global warming potential refrigerants and also refrigerants that have, have properties, uh, you know, kind of a, a really ultimate refrigerant is CO2. Uh, the problem with CO2 is it runs at very high pressure. So it pretty much has to be a factory sealed system. And the infrastructure to service a CO2 based heat pump in most areas just it isn't there yet. So you can go buy the product, but when it breaks down and if it requires servicing of the actual refrigeration system, uh, it may be hard to find somebody that has the, the tooling and the knowledge to service it. So I, I think we will see more of it in the future, but keep your eye on R32 and also uh, propane as, as you know, five years from now, we'll, we'll be t dealing with heat pumps likely running on those refrigerants. Part of what gets me excited about propane is we have to seal it now. We can't let it leak. It's it's that much more vital. Um, yeah. and we, you know, we run natural gas lines through buildings all the time, and that Absolutely. doesn't seem and, to be a huge issue. And to so, your point, Kyle, I, honestly, I, I don't see other than, you know, generating new codes and new revenue based on those codes, why seven pounds of uh, propane in a heat pump is really that much more dangerous than you know, running a couple the, hundred pounds next to the house already yeah, and or, or piping running all the way through the house, you know, gas mm -hmm. going to all the different appliances in a house. So exactly. I think it'll sort itself out, but uh, you know, the, the gatekeepers will um, they'll get their toll. So I'll leave it like that. Can you guys um, just quickly, what is the uh, operating pressure for propane to make the refrigeration cycle work? Is that, good, is yes, that an good issue? Question, uh, Travis. I honestly don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. Um, but I don't know either. We're on equal footing for the first yeah, time in this entire presentation. In a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, it is not as high as CO2. So the potential to use it, uh, you know, field service at field um, charge a unit with propane is, is definitely there compared to, to CO2. And we may see things, for example, monoblock systems where all the refrigerant is outside. I, I think you'll see propane being accepted in that application before you see it come into a split system because it's all outside. And a four ton heat pump only has six or seven pounds of refrigerant in it. So, you know, you could probably leak more propane if you leave your gas valve on on your barbecue compared to uh, you know, what could happen with a heat pump. Travis, you stumped positive energy crew as well with your propane question. <laughs> I'm going to go buy a lottery the ticket. Show's history. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying to go uh, find the answer, but they don't have it on hand. Normally they call Brian, but he doesn't know right now. <laughs> one of the things that I've heard is that uh, we're likely to start seeing some growth in the, the technical knowledge around CO2 because a lot of grocery stores, as far as I understand, are switching over their refrigeration to CO2, which is kind of dragging the commercial end of the, the refrigeration world along. So yeah. we'll start seeing it. But yeah, it's definitely a, a specialized niche set of skills to work with it. Yeah, the, um, the beauty of CO2 is it would enable an air water heat pump to do 160, 170 degree water temperatures, even below zero outside. So the temperature lift that's possible is, is way beyond what we have right now. And why that's a benefit is think about legacy hydronic systems that were designed around boilers, uh, 180, 190 degree water temperature. Bringing a heat pump into a legacy hydronic system with high water temperatures, it, it's, not as, it's not as if it's impossible, uh, especially with outdoor reset control but the percentage of the seasonal energy is definitely going to go down because once we're over roughly about 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the heat pump is done. Uh, you're going to some form of auxiliary energy uh, with it, you know, with an R410A heat pump system, typical of today's technology, 130 is, is about it. Uh, the manufacturers will tell you they can go higher and you can, 
but you're, you're putting a lot of stress on the compressor to go above that temperature. One thing I think is important to talk about is money. We haven't talked a lot about cost of installation mm -hmm. and retrofits versus new. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could spend a little bit of time on that. Yeah, uh, you know, a four ton air and water heat pump in round numbers is nine to $10,000. Uh, I would tell you a four ton system installed. And, and again, it's, it's like buying a car. What, what are you installing? Are you doing floor heating throughout the building? Are you doing panel radiators? Uh, let's, let's give it some assumptions. If it's a four ton system with maybe eight panel radiators and a home run system with today's pricing, uh, if you've checked out copper fittings lately, it's uh, you want to be seated when you look at the pricing. Uh, probably in the range of twenty-five to maybe thirty thousand uh, dollars. Two states right now, Vermont and Massachusetts, both have rebates or incentives on air to water. Uh, in Vermont, it's a thousand dollars per ton of capacity, and in Massachusetts, I believe it's uh, twelve hundred fifty dollars per ton. Um, I'm trying to work with NYSERDA to establish air to water as a qualifying technology within their Clean Heat New York program. I think they will get there. Um, they aren't quite there yet. Uh, the air to water market, one of the things that is uh, kind of the chicken and the egg scenario, right now there is actually no dedicated standard of performance uh, like uh, an uh, uh, AHRI standard. There are similar standards for commercial chiller equipment and so forth. And some of the manufacturers are kind of, well, trying to find a standard that's close to the product that we have. But um, one of the challenges is getting a standard that would define exactly what do you mean by capacity? You know, what temperatures, what um, outside temperatures, what fluid temperatures and so forth. Um, Vermont and Massachusetts, they rely on a number that was actually generated by Jake Marin up there at Efficiency Vermont. Uh, their qualification number is um, a minimum COP of 1.7 uh, when it's five degrees outside, 110 degree leaving water temperature. And I will tell you just about all the equipment on the market now can meet or exceed that standard. So uh, that was actually the standard that the EPA used in their uh, Emerging Technology Award back, I think it was 2019. Uh, they recognized air to water as an emerging technology uh, and allowed manufacturers that could meet that performance to actually put emerging technology award in their literature. Um, so uh, again, I think we will see more acceptance of air to water heat pumps. Uh, quite honestly, as I try to show in my opening slide, a lot of people just don't know what they are. Yeah. But when you look at the market globally, it's about 4 million units per year. Uh, half of which goes into China. Uh, and then Europe is probably in, right now in a range of 600, 650,000 air to water heat pump installs per year. So it's become a very strong market in, in Europe. Uh, some statistics I've seen in Germany, which is kind of the epicenter of hydronics, uh, over the last three years, there's actually been more heat pumps installed than boilers. And a lot of it is driven by uh, the term they use is directives, um, basically legislation that is displacing fossil fuel in favor of electricity. But the European market is, is very strong right now with um, air to water heat pumps. We were in uh, Switzerland, both Travis and I, earlier this summer and toured a couple of multifamily uh, buildings and they were all using large Stiebel Eltron air to water heat pumps for cooling, mm -hmm. minimal cooling, but uh, mostly heating. And they also had options for, um, this was interesting, district loop heating, hydronic heating yeah. that gets piped throughout whole communities. And they have community biomass boilers yeah. um, to give people options for where their heating was coming from for their multifamily. Yeah. Austria is another good example, uh, especially with pellet boilers. So they get about half of all their space heating energy from pellets and the district distribution systems with heat meters on individual buildings. Yeah. We have all that technology. It's just and it is slowly gaining more acceptance over here, uh, but you know, bringing heat pumps into a district system, um, obviously the machines we've been talking about are residential class machines, but you can get air to water heat pumps, uh, 25, 50, even a hundred tons. 
and potentially set those up with uh, with some type of district system. Yeah, I guess and one work diagram. happening with district systems right now throughout Massachusetts. I know they have some pilot programs throughout Massachusetts looking at district heat. Sorry, yeah. Kyle. Yeah, no problem. One of the diagrams that you didn't show on your slides is just getting rid of all of the hydronic um, radiate distribution and just go all forced air, but still use the air to water heat pump. Um, and that's certainly an option. That was one of the questions that was asked, but yeah, it, it is, uh, but you know, let me, let me just throw again, a wrench into the gears here. Uh, if you're going air to water only to go back to air as delivery, you're actually better off to just do it, um, go directly to yeah. air, uh, you know, air to air, because every time you're pushing that heat through another heat exchanger, through another fluid, there's a temperature uh, difference that has to be set up to make that heat transfer uh, occur. And that ultimately all backs up to the performance of the heat pump. The more bottlenecks, if you will, we put in that path, the higher the temperature the heat pump has to operate at, and that, that brings down the COP. So yes, it is possible to use air to water, send the fluid through the building uh, as water, and then go to you know, one or more air handlers. It's possible to do that, but um, thermodynamically, that is not as efficient as, you know, for example, the panel radiator type of system. Right. So we didn't talk too much about it, but, uh... Can you tell us a little bit more about radiant cooling options? You, you showed air handler cooling options, but can you elaborate a little bit about what there are for options for radiant cooling? Yeah, um, radiant cooling is another, I, I'd say an emerging technology. Uh, you're gonna see it applied, it already has been applied primarily in commercial buildings. Uh, radiant cooling, first of all, you can only do sensible cooling. Uh, you cannot bring that surface down below dew point. Obviously, you're going to make a mess with condensation. So where radiant cooling is used right now are in buildings that have, for example, high solar gains. And they're trying to absorb those solar gains or a good portion of those solar gains directly in the floor. They have controls on the chilled water so that the temperature stays typically about three degrees above the current room dew point. And the difficulty in bringing that into residential, first of all, um, you've got to have dew point sensing that is accurate. And right now there's not a lot of off the shelf equipment on the market, at least that I'm aware of that can do that. The, the other thing that is uh, important in any building, whether it's residential or commercial, when you're doing radiant cooling, you can have different dew points in different areas of the building at different times. So for example, a vestibule on a humid day, you're gonna, you're gonna have a lot of moisture coming into that vestibule. And if your dew point sensor is inside in a drier area, you know, it's saying you're fine, everything, you know, no condensation, and you could have condensation form in that other area. So we have to do, it, it's a heavier uh, requirement for controls for one. Um, there have been some residential projects done. Uh, I know in Europe there are uh, somebody, you know, you had mentioned Switzerland. Uh, one of the companies in Switzerland is uh, Zender. And yeah. Zender has got systems that do radiant cooling. We've looked at them. Uh, by the time they get over here, they, they are very expensive to install. And I think until the market really matures, uh, my preference would be to direct people towards air handlers. And specifically uh, in, a, in a residential application, an average size residential application, a single air handler that has a chill water coil and a drip pan. And now you have one point where you're forming condensate, one point where you're dealing with you know, drainage, cleaning the coil, cleaning the filter. Um, you can do console air handlers. In fact, you can buy air handlers that look identical to mini split wall units. The only difference is there's water going through the coil instead of refrigerant. They work. Um, the downside is, uh, let's say we put four or five of those into a, a building. You've got to run supply and return water to each of those. And all that piping has to be insulated. You have to run power. You also have to have a condensate drain for each one of those. So it's possible to do it. You're probably looking, by the time you do all the infrastructure, you're probably looking at about $3,000 per air handler to do something like that. And 
it, it just becomes very expensive relative to a, a central air handler. And with a central air handler, there are ways to do zoning. You can do zamp, uh, dampers on the zones. Um, there's actually some products on the market now that have a single coil in a box and then they use um, axial fans, small axial fans that go out to different zones and just basically turn on different fans for di you know different zones. So I, I guess I would summarize, there are some applications where reading clearly makes sense. I don't think the residential market is ready for it yet, both from a technical standpoint and from a cost standpoint. We, we may see it, but watch for the commercial market. It, it, uh, the big draw for reading cooling in the commercial market is that you can move the vast majority of the sensible cooling load, which is, you know, let's say in round numbers, about 70% of the total cooling load is sensible heat. You can move that from air side delivery to water side delivery. And what that means, that's a huge savings in terms of the energy to move that cooling effect through the building. We, we talked about it with distribution efficiency. So it, literally thousands of dollars a year can be saved in a, in a commercial building simply by delivering sensible cooling using water versus, uh, versus air. That's always I the hang up. Oh, go ahead. I think one of the things that's uh, attractive uh, to our company at looking at radiant heating and cooling options is, is then if we couple this with on-site generation of power, we can maximize the storage potential because we can store more energy in water at a better cost point than we can in batteries to turn it back into heat or cooling. So yeah. the thought is, you know, during peak production during the day, we can be heating a large storage tank peak production during the summer, we can be chilling a storage tank and then bleeding the energy out of there as we That's need true. Uh, Water's, you know, is the ideal storage material. Now I'll take it one step further um, too on that, Ben. Think about all the light commercial buildings that are slab on grade with minimal zoning, things like Midas muffler shops or woodworking shops, welding shops, um, fire stations, six inch thick. Oh, we just did some math on this. Um, if you take a 40 foot by 80 foot rectangular floor plan with a six inch thick concrete slab, the thermal mass that's in that slab was, is equivalent to over 5,000 gallons of water. So when you have a, th a large thermal mass in the floor and you combine that with a heat pump and then you mix in time of use electric rates. So, you know, charging that slab on off peak and basically coasting into the on peak periods uh, you know, again, uh, we're, we're at the cusp of potential applications like that. We need some more modeling to know, you know, just what is the ideal combination. But the nice thing about that is, you know, a 5,000 gallon water storage tank, uh, you can get them, but I, I, I wouldn't venture to guess what, what the cost is today on something like that. But, you know, a, a 40 by 80 by six inch thick concrete slab. Uh, again, uh, concrete is what, $200 a yard now. Uh, it's definitely less expensive to do it that way. And the other thing about those commercial applications, typically those garage type applications, they can tolerate a little bit more of a temperature swing than a residential application. So a four or five degree temperature swing over a 24 hour period, which, you know, may enable a lot more input and extraction from that slab can be tolerated there compared to, you know, residential application. So I think that that's a niche where air to water uh, really could go well. And the nice thing about it too, you eliminate the buffer tank. You, you, you know, you got the equivalent of 5,000 gallons of water in the thermal mass of the slab. You don't need a buffer tank. So uh, that's, that's a little niche that I think will move, uh, move some systems. Self-buffering, you charge extra for that if you're smart. Self-buffering. Self thing I wanted to say for the, just taking a big step back here, you know, we're, we're getting off into the weeds, nerding out on this, which is fantastic. And I absolutely love it. Um, I have almost every single client come to me that says they want a radiant floor and they also want air conditioning. And right. most clients don't understand that that means it's going to cost more. There's two distribution systems. You've got a forced air system and a radiant floor. That's double the distribution systems. It means more money. So for people on this call that are listening, these aren't 
cheaper. It's not a magic thing that's saving us all kinds of money. They can do some really cool things, increase efficiency. There's a lot of awesome things, but it's not necessarily cheaper than the standard system. It no, adds cost. Not. But, you know, Mer Mercedes costs more than a Chevy. So, of course. You know, you, I just wanted to make sure that point was made. You, you can, uh, you really want to sell, what, what sells hydronics is comfort. Uh, you know, most people, as to our point here, nerding out on, on the technology, um, you know, as an engineer, I love that stuff, but most consumers could care less about, you know, is it a variable speed pump? Is it a cross-link polyethylene tube? They don't care. They just want to be comfortable. And if you can deliver superior comfort with the radiant floor system, or for that matter, the panel rads, and then also deliver cooling, right. um, you know, you're simply delivering a higher value proposition than an all air system. And one crazy thing is the more the comfort matters, the more the home. So the, the worse your home is in terms of a performance standpoint, thermally and an envelope, the more the radiant system helps. And the lower the load on the home, the less it starts to matter in terms of comfort. Correct. So and, that, and that quite massive honestly- Massive house, it's not as significant in terms of that comfort difference. That's right. And that's one of the reasons I, I focused on a panel reds tonight. Um, one, one of the things to keep in mind, if, if you are dealing with clients that want floor heating in a low energy building, make sure they understand the floors are not going to get very warm. Uh, you know, you do the math on that and you're going to see, even on a design day, uh, a, a building that has maybe 10 BTUs per square foot per hour design load, a floor temperature of about 73 degrees is all that's required. So, you know, many of the ads over the years for radiant floor heating have shown, you know, the babies on the floor, the barefoot people on the floor and they've come they're selling this idea of barefoot friendly floors and that's true when you know when the floors get up in the 80s but we've cut the loads to a third of what they were maybe 25 30 years ago and to think we can push the floors to those temperatures you know you're, you're going to open all the windows and ventilate the heat you simply don't need to run the floor that warm so the, the takeaway is make sure if a client wants radiant floor heating in a very low load building, it'll work and the heat pump's gonna love it because it's gonna be low water temperatures. But are they expecting that barefoot friendly floor? And, you know, I, and again, I've seen people disappointed. You know, I thought I was buying warm floors as the retort there. Uh, and that's where, again, I go back to the panel reds, running a panel radiator at 110, you know, if you come in, you're cold and you just want to stand by something that's warm, go over and stand by or sit in front of the panel ride. You'll love it. This is the, uh, the battle that we always fight though. It, it's just like Kyle pointing out, well, now we're talking about a duplicate system, the panel rads. It's the same thing I have to fight with my, uh, my clients on our, our mini split wall cassettes or ceiling cassettes. Oh, I don't want to see those. I, it, the same thing with panel rat. Well, that hurts my furniture situation. I wanted to put my couch there. Like, it's so frustrating. Like, that's the beauty of the floor being the the collector and distributor. It's yeah, it's, or, or a ceiling. Uh, you know, very few people today have really understand you can you can provide excellent heating comfort from a radiant ceiling. Uh, we've done projects with heat pumps and, and radiant ceilings, and actually in cooling. You know, going back to where we were talking about radiant cooling, a ceiling is the ideal surface for radiant cooling. It, it is definitely better than a floor from a comfort standpoint and also uh, just as a better match to what the load characteristics are. Uh, and radiant ceilings uh, can operate at low water temperatures. And the nice thing about radiant ceilings is, you know, when's the last time you saw a shade carpet over a radiant ceiling? Just no umbrellas in the house. Well, uh, yeah, but... Radiant ceilings are, uh, you know, you can put them in, whether it's, you know, drywall finish on the ceiling, you don't see anything. And yet they, they work very well. Well, I guess I would like to have everyone have an opportunity to kind of uh, sum up and go around the horn because we are getting to the last five minutes of our show. Uh, but I also hate to, to abruptly halt the conversation and, and I don't want to leave anyone's question unanswered. So uh, I guess we use our time how we see fit. Uh, is anyone just burning to get something out they didn't quite get a chance to address? I think for me, the, the thing that I've been kind of obsessing over recently is decoupling our 
sensible conditioning from our latent conditioning in the building. So we're looking at going to radiant systems, both heating and cooling to deal with our sensible comfort mm -hmm. and going to uh, air-based systems to deal with the latent, the filtration, the ventilation, humidification, dehumidification, all of the above and decoupling them. Because then we can run pipes through, like you mentioned, John, it's very easy for us to route pipes to and from places, uh, you know, at the behest of architects doing their best to prevent us from getting them around buildings. Uh, and then we can use much smaller ducted systems to handle all the uh, the latent yeah. and ventilation. I try to make it difficult, but you somehow find a way, Ben. Yeah. Well, That's why they yeah, pay me the big bucks. To, to Ben's point, uh, commercial buildings, that, that is a very uh, contemporary trend right now. Uh, what are called DOAS systems, direct outside air systems, uh, where you know, you are decoupling the late load and a sensible load, uh, smaller ducting, less ceiling height requirements, uh, a lot of a lot of benefits. It's conceivable that could filter down into residential. I, I think you might see it in a high end custom residential setting before you'd see it in, you know, average Joe 2000 square foot, pretty good house type of scenario. We have to use the money of the wealthy to subsidize research and supply chain creation in order for the average show to afford it. So there are some over the top hydronic systems uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. I just talked to a contractor last week who specializes in those. These are 20,000 square foot houses with two million dollar mechanical systems. So he's doing it's a good positive job. energies business model, they say. Uh, his the Robin Hood technique. Got, He's got lots of clients with blank checks and uh, he does beautiful work, but it is way beyond average Joe. And to be very honest, I think hydronics over the years has had kind of a bad rap, partly because systems like that get featured in magazines or ads. You know, you, you see a picture of a hydronic system with 40 circulators lined up on the wall and the craftsmanship could be beautiful, but it's entirely in to my opinion, uh, that's not the way to do it. Uh, it's certainly these systems we've looked at tonight. These are simple, repeatable, and I, I use the word elegant because there, there's a lot of um, overlap in terms of functionality there. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word synergy. There's a lot of synergy in the design. Uh, they don't have to be complex. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to be, quite honestly, you don't have to have a Nest thermostat in every room. I would talk, I would do my best to talk you out of that. Yes. Uh, I would put a thermostatic radiator valve in there any day over a Nest thermostat. And it's not because the Nest thermostats don't work, but it, it is, you know, both from a, a complication uh, and, a, and a cost standpoint, it is just not, it's just not the way to do it for an average house. And hydronics as a market share nationally you know, over the years that I, I've been practicing in that area, it really hasn't changed much. It's maybe four or 5% nationally. And part of it is the perception that hydronic systems are for the, the wealthy and you have to have, you know, the 40 pumps and $10,000 worth of controls in the system. Um, you don't, the, these systems are pretty simple and pretty, pretty easy to understand. They're simple, they're easy to service. Uh, they're easy to scale up and down within, at least within a residential context. So that's that's kind of where I'm at at this point in, in the career is to push simple, repeatable design. Amen. I guess one that thing that we didn't talk about was climate zones in terms of where is this best applicable? You know, in Florida, should we be doing radiant cooling and radiant heating or should we be thinking more up top? I mean, I... I yeah, maybe you um, could just touch on that. You know, you you'll, you will see some floor heating in Florida. Uh, it's driven it's driven in the higher end market uh, by the fact that you know if you go to Florida in February and you walk around barefoot on a terrazzo floor, your feet are going to be cold. So uh, it's it's not a lot of load, but it's there to improve comfort as opposed to you know we install it maybe in New England to be the primary heat source. Um, Again, radiant cooling market in a residential. I honestly don't know anybody that is doing that right now, uh, even in some of the higher end projects. And I, I think the concern is, uh, you know, if a control fails, a dew point control fails, you, you can make a mess in a hurry, a very expensive mess. So 
<coughs> excuse me, I would, I would still lean back towards a central air handler, uh, controlling, you know, where your condensation is occurring. Um, the radium market is, is doing fine. You know, uh, looking back 25 years ago, things like PEX tubing and so forth were more novel than they are today. They're very much commodities. You know, you can buy pretty much anything you want on several sources online. Um, but I do think one of the game changers, uh, where we're at right now with all the uh, regulations that are being formed uh, around decarbonization and around building electrification, uh, in talking to contractors, you know, I try to stay out of the politics entirely. And I tell them, you know, set the politics aside, look at it as an opportunity. Uh, the big game changer is heat pumps can do cooling, boilers can't. That, you know, that sounds like a simple, obvious statement, but that is a game changer in a hydronics market. And back to, you know, uh, I think it was Travis that said, we want to do heat, we want to do hydronic heating, but we also want cooling. Um, heat pumps are, are going to be the new boiler, so to speak, that enables that. Now it's a matter of just tooling up to, to properly deal with that chilled water. And uh, my suggestion is the baby steps. Uh, start with a single air handler with a chill water coil and get some of that on your belt before you dive into the, the radiant cooling market. Solid summation. I, uh, I have to put a fork in this, guys. This has been a great conversation. We, we had fantastic engagement. The chat was on fire. We had engagement through the whole show. No one left early. It really has been... Uh, quite enlightening uh, on a topic that I frankly didn't know that much about. So I really appreciate your preparation, John. Uh, I certainly appreciate the uh, added intellectual upgrade of having Kyle on the show. And then as always, Ben, your, ben, your beard is luxurious. <laughs> you only get credit. I showered for last week. <laughs> nice. Uh, John, thank you, sir. Kyle, always a pleasure. Travis, I'll see you next week. Thank you, John. Everybody, anybody who wants to chat, my email address is in the chat box. Send me a, a, a chat, benjaminbogey at gmail.com or ben at bpcgb.com. Uh, happy to share that. Is the chat still being added to Green Building Advisor every week? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the status on that, but um, it was. Yeah, you can also, time, right? yeah, I think so. I think so. But, um, uh, and John, if you're okay with it, sir, I'll distribute your presentation to any uh, willing yeah. askers. Yeah, the PDF right. file has got all the everything we went over tonight. This yeah. will also be posted on YouTube at some point for those who are wondering. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Thanks all.